when we were first approached about doing a, uh, a history presentation as, uh, as part of the 100th anniversary of the department, we kind of struggled about, well, who's going to do this presentation? And it sort of fell to the person who's been here for maybe a third of the life of the, of the department. So uh, I appreciate that opportunity. Uh, Mary Beth also sent me uh, sort of speaker instructions before the meet, before this conference that said, um, don't, don't speak for more than 20 minutes. That's a problem. Um, don't use more than 30 slides. That's a problem too. So I'm going to move fast. Yes, it's, uh, I have a 30-minute slot. I'm going to try to get through it quickly. Uh, we probably won't have a whole lot of time for questions and answers, but I probably couldn't answer a lot of the questions about our history anyway. So uh, with that... This is a kind of a quick table of contents, kind of outline what we're going to cover. Uh, we're going to talk about um, reinforced concrete bridges, pre-stressed concrete bridges, concrete sedimental bridges, and then kind of wrap up and talk about pre-stressed concrete network arches. So this slide and the following slide give you a little idea of where Texas concrete bridges fit into the major points in history. Concrete bridges in Texas have been around since the early 1900s. Uh, in 1916 was when Congress passed uh, uh, a law that basically required all state DOT, all, the organization of all state DOTs in order to receive federal funding. Then as uh, many of you are aware, 1917 is when uh, Governor Ferguson signed into the law that basically created the Texas Highway Department. Some of the other notable reinforced concrete bridges such as concrete slab, concrete girder, and concrete rigid frames, most of those were po post-World War II. We'll talk about kind of the evolution in terms of the impact that World War II had. So reinforced concrete bridges, those are kind of the first type of uh, concrete bridge that we did. Uh, reinforced concrete was invented uh, in the 1840s but not widely used until the 1900s. One of the earlier types of Texas bridges uh, were reinforced concrete arch bridges. And arch, arch bridges, for those of you who don't know, work um, transferring the weight of the bridge and its loads partially into the horizontal thrust on either side. This is a picture of the bridge that spans Galveston Bay. It was built in 1912. The intent of the closed spandrel arch type bridge is to mimic stone arches. These types of bridges display a natural aesthetic of ancient stone without the time and expense. As first concrete bridges in Texas clo closed, spandrel arch bridges gained increasing popularity in the early 20th century. This picture is of the Waller Creek Bridge on San Jacinto Boulevard in Austin. It was built in 1932. The core of this bridge is three reinforced concrete closed spandrel arches. This is a photograph of the County Road 210 bridge uh, at Bunton Branch near Kyle, Texas. It's another example of a closed spandrel arch bridge. Uh, it's the oldest bridge in Hayes County. It was built in 1915 as part of a federal, age pro federal aid program to help deliver the mail. So after closed spandrel arches, then the next evolution was the open spandrel arches. Um, this eliminated the walls and the fill material of the closed spandrel, reduced the dead load, saved, saved cost, reduced the amount of material, um, and it also provided a much more aesthetic structure, which was another major factor. Uh, this picture is of the Dallas Oak Cliff Viaduct, which spans the Trinity River in Dallas, and it was built uh, between 1909 and 1912. Here's another open spandrel arch bridge. This one is in Wichita Falls, built in 1927 by the Luton Bridge Company. It's over the Wichita River on Scott Avenue. So then a, sort of another evolution that happened about the same time was uh, concrete T-beam bridges. These first became standard drawings uh, issued by Texas in 1918, and the last set of concrete girder uh, T-beam standards was issued in 1956, so we have a lot of these types of structures out there. Um, from 1945 to 1965, engineers in Texas worked with new materials and construction methods to develop innovative approaches to bridge design. Uh, some bridges from this era are the earliest examples of certain technologies eventually adopted as national standards, um, and we'll talk about some of those later. Um, these served as those important kind of first steps as we expanded our knowledge and understanding of steel and concrete. 
Next came concrete slab bridges. This is for the, for the particularly for the shorter spans. Um, they're just single slabs reinforced uh, with reinforcing steel. Uh, this is an example of one on US 87 over Brady Creek and Brownwood. It's you can see in the in the photograph. It's a variable depth slab with increased depth over the piers. After World War II, the concrete slab be, slab bridge became very popular. Uh, variations of this type of bridge include the FS, which after years of working with FS slabs, I finally one day learned FS stood for farm system. It was a set of bridges that were developed to, um, to be deployed on the, on the network of farm roads that were being developed. We also had continuous slabs and single slab spans. Um, and here's another view of a, of a concrete girder bridge. And then probably the concrete girder bridge that most of us are familiar with are the panform bridges. Um, these were developed in the 1940s, also in anticipation of the farm system roads, uh, a set of steel forms that were reusable by our contractors. Um, this became kind of the structure type in the state of Texas, the most, uh, most often deployed and one of the most economical. Um, another structure type that came in the 1940s, kind of post-World War II, was the uh, concrete rigid frame bridges. And you'll see a number of these throughout the state, some of them on I-35 in Austin. Um, this one pictured here is uh, the bridge built in 1950 on Santa Fe Avenue uh, in Dallas. So the next big evolution in concrete bridges was pre-stress concrete. Pre-stress concrete arrived in the US from Europe around 1950 which seemed like a really revolutionary new concept. Um, Texas Highway Department then began experimenting with pre-stress concrete almost immediately. Um, American engineers embraced another European concept you know, with, with much enthusiasm, actually. Uh, and as it turns out, the history of pre-stress concrete goes back about as far as the history of reinforced concrete itself. Uh, from the beginning, efforts were made to eliminate cracking and reinforced concrete by squeezing the concrete with the reinforcing, but pre-compression always mysteriously disappeared. Uh, by the time plastic flow of concrete was recognized and the first practical applications were achieved in the, uh, in the mid-1930s, Europe was then um, gripped into an economic depression and then, of course, the Second World War. And a lot of that knowledge was actually lost. It was kind of shrouded in, uh, in, war, in secrecy rel rel relative to the war. Um, American engineers also then introduced concepts of pre-stressing uh, between 1947 and 1950. Um, there is a, a gentleman, Professor Gustav Maniel, wrote the first textbook. Um, we actually have a copy of this book from 1948 in the, in the Bridge Division Library. When we developed our first pre-stress beam bridges, this would have been the only publication we really had to go by. So then our first pre-stress concrete beam bridge that we ever did sort of married the old pan form bridge, which were very popular and very economical. Uh, the, Wal the Walnut Lane Bridge opened um, in, um, I forget which state, I don't have it written down here. Um, but then our sort of counter was the San Bernard River Bridge in Austin County. And, and what we did was we, we basically took two panform bridges uh, with a center pier, a temporary brace, draped a parabolic strand in there, um, and post-tensioned it to, to create what was then a very revolutionary 60-foot span. Uh, unfortunately, this bridge was replaced just a few years ago. Um, not because of any major deterioration, but it just had become functionally obsolete, way too narrow for the, for the traffic we had at the time. Um, Bridge Division senior engineer Jim Graves, uh, pictured here, uh, was assigned the task of further developing pre-stressed concrete bridges in Texas. Uh, at a 1953 short course lecture, he talked about the development of long span precast uh, pre-stressed concrete beams. So that first opportunity for those pre-stressed concrete beams really came with the Corpus Christi Harbor Bridge. Uh, in addition to the steel truss that everybody's familiar with, um, there are actually um, 2,000 feet of 40-foot and 60-foot pre-stressed concrete beam spans in the approaches. These were actually built on site uh, with parabolic ducts. They were actually a post-tensioned beam. Uh, Jim Graves, at the same time that this bridge was designed, Jim Graves developed 
uh, a set of beams that he called type A, B, and C. And if you're familiar with the old beam standards that TxDOT had up through uh, about 2007, those beam types were still around. Uh, the Corpus Christi Harbor Bridge was largely designed using a Bureau of Public Roads criteria. At the time, there were really not a lot of, na there weren't any national specifications for pre stress design. Um, because of concerns about constructability, um, ASHO and PCI worked together, a joint committee um, headed by William Dean of the Florida Highway Department to develop some standard shapes. As a result, the standard shapes were rather delayed for about three years or more. Um, by then, Texas was probably well ahead of the nation in terms of developing beam shapes. Uh, we did have Randall Alexander, our state bridge engineer, pictured here. He was on the committee that helped develop those shapes. Um, the ASHO Type I, Type I shape that was finally ultimately arrived at was exactly identical to uh, the Texas Type A beam. Uh, those beam standards were issued in 1957. Um, and a number of states are still using them today. So the first bridge using these new beams was the Texas and New Orleans Railroad Overpass located in Carnes County near Kennedy, Texas. Uh, it was let in November of 56 and was completed in June of 57. It was the first pre-tensioned and pre-cast concrete beam bridge in the state. And the beam fabricator was Texas Concrete who is still fabricating beams for TxDOT today. Um, as a little side note, one of the innovations that came out of this uh, was bearing pads. The first pre-stressed I-beam bridges were done on steel bolster shoes, just like ro our old roll girder bridges. Uh, again, Bridge Division Engineer Jim Graves, he reached out to the Oil States Rubber Company in Arlington, Texas, uh, and through that collaboration developed the first neoprene rubber bearing pads. The first bridge that used those rubber bearing pads was in Victoria, uh, the Coletto Creek Bridge on FM 237. It was the first in the U.S. to use neoprene bearing pads, and an article about the bearing pads was written by Jim Graves and published in Engineering News Record in 1957. Extensive communication between bridge division engineers and TxDOT contractors contributed to the rapid rise of precast pre beams in Texas. Uh, there are, we have archival letters uh, that Bob Carr and Jim Graves collaborated extensively during the 1950s. Um, and in fact, Bob Carr was the founder of Texas Concrete and also the first president of the Precast Concrete Manufacturers Association in Texas. So all of this was going on in the early 1950s and then come along in 1956, Eisenhower signs the uh, Federal Aid Highway Act, which we're all familiar with, that built, built the interstate highway system. Um, and pre-stressed concrete beams very much lent itself to a way to sort of standardize and take the, almost an industrial approach to, to bridge building. Um, as the interstate program gained momentum, we in Texas had the honor of having some of the lowest costs per square foot in the nation. That is a fact that still remains today. Year in and year out, we're, if not the lowest, we're one of the lowest in the nation in large part because of our use of pre-stressed concrete and their standardization. This photo here is uh, Buena Vista over ING uh, railroad tracks uh, in San Antonio. It was completed in 1958. So nearing up for a time during the 1950s, end stresses were controlled by post-tensioning, draped parabolic strands to reduce end splitting stresses. And so end blocks were the characteristics of the beams in the day. Um, and those became a real fabrication issue, as you might expect, to have to fabricate those end blocks with varying girder lengths. Uh, a lot of research was done, and we determined that those end blocks really weren't necessary. We built the Angelina River Bridge, which is over 8,000 feet long, uh, through Angelina National Forest on State Highway 147. After the bridge was built, then the valley was flooded, forming McGee Bend Reservoir. Bridge was designed in 1956 and opened to traffic in 59. It's got 115 spans of 70-foot pre-stressed concrete beams. Uh, with the construction of the Angelina River Bridge, the procedures for draping pre-tension strand were worked out so that longer spans could be pre-tensioned, and of course we didn't have to continue to use end blocks. Uh, a major part of our deployment of pre-stressed concrete in Texas has been through the research program. Full-scale tests were conducted on type C beams beginning in 1959. Um, these tests were on beams with and without end blocks. The absence of the end block, again, greatly simplifi simplifies construction. 
as I said, rate research played a very important role here. You see a, uh, a type C beam being moved into position into a test frame at the Ferguson lab at University of Texas uh, for fatigue testing in 1984. Uh, research projects are a great cooperation between universities and TxDOT. Uh, while the university professors perform the bulk of the research, Every research project that TxDOT does has a research panel team that provides that technical assistance to the researchers. Uh, it's been a real key to our success. We've also worked closely with uh, various trade industries, uh, trade organizations, PCI, PCI PCMA, AGC, uh, to develop new products that could easily be deployed and help speed construction and, and of course, keeping our costs low. The next sort of major innovation in, uh, in pre-stressed concrete with regard to girders was the, the, uh, the research we did in 2005 to develop a new I-beam shape based on the materials that we have available to us today, and that's the text girder. The first text girder standards were issued in 2007, um, and some of the earliest projects, of course, predate that. Pre-stressed beams and panels help Texas maintain one of the lowest bridge costs in the nation. Excellent durability is also achieved. Um, the use of precast also speeds constructions, minimizes traffic disruptions. Um, it's really one of our best solutions we've ever come up with. This is just a, 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 a shot of the Jim Cowan Memorial Bridge. It's over Lake Belton in the Waco District, 3,800 feet long. It not only used the pre-stressed U-beams that were developed at TxDOT, but also the the subdeck panels, which we'll talk about here in a minute. And then this was the, one of the early projects we did with precast caps. So precast subdeck panels were uh, an innovation that actually was kind of first used on an Illinois toll road project, but Texas grabbed a hold of that in the early 60s and really expanded on it. Um, re we've reached a point now where the vast majority of our bridges in Texas are done using pre-stressed subdeck panels. A lot of that research on subject panels was done here at Texas A&M. Um, one of the single greatest innovations, I think, for, uh, for our bridges, about 97% of our bridges are built using subject panels at last count. So kind of that next innovation then as well, what can we do to sort of expand subject panels? And you'll hear Kevin Moyer here later this morning talk about uh, precast overhang panels. This is a shot of the Rocky Creek Bridge in Wise County, and again, I won't steal Kevin's thunder. He'll talk about it extensively. Uh, but here's another view of uh, another project, uh, FM 726 on Brushy Creek. We also use subject panels on the Galveston Bay Bridge, and the unique thing we did here was based on some research done by the University of Texas. We were able to use the precast panels to the ends of the spans. This is something we have not uh, adopted as a standard, but we're certainly moving in that direction. It helps, again, to reduce that, that cast-in-place forming. And again, just another shot of uh, full depth, of, of, I mean, sub-deck panels taken to the ends, ends of the span. And we'll skip over. So another, uh, another innovation in Texas is our uh, deck slab beams, and shown here. Uh, is the Cottonwood Creek Bridge is a PCI award winner. Uh, with this system, it's possible to replace existing bridges in just a few days. We use a precast uh, deck slab beam that doesn't require any cast in place uh, concrete to be placed on top. There's just some uh, connections and uh, a grout between the beams. This project used precast caps in addition and, and was completed in just seven working days. Another view of precast uh, slab beams going into place. So moving on, the next type of uh, major structure that we did was segmental bridges. This is actually um, a European innovation. Began in the late 1960s as textile engineers sort of challenged researchers to say, we need to find economical ways to build these really long span bridges, particularly when we're spanning the, uh, the Gulf Intercoastal Waterway and those kinds of features. And so the first segmental bridge built not only in Texas but also in the U.S. was the JFK Causeway, uh, built in 1972. And while this bridge is already uh, more than 40 years old, it is performing outstanding even though it's in a marine environment. And so we're getting outstanding durability out of our, 
uh, out of our, pre, our uh, segmental bridges. There's a little more than, I think there's 61 of them in the state to date with more on the way. Uh, in the early 80s, the Texas Turnpike Authority completed a record-setting span of 750 feet over the Houston Ship Channel using segmental concrete. And here's a photo of that bridge as it looks today. And so presently, the only precast concrete segmental cable stayed bridge in Texas is the Veterans Memorial Bridge spanning the Natchez River uh, near Port Arthur. The bridge was built in 1991 and has a main span of 640 feet. The pier towers and bridge uh, superstructure are made from precast post-tension segments, and the bridge is a tribute to the efficiency and durability of precast concrete. And here's just another view. So again, I mentioned that segmental bridges were developed in order to span the Gulf Intercoastal Waterway, and here's another example. It was built in 2009, uh, the Matagorda, Br Matagorda Bridge that was built uh, to replace an old swing bridge. It opened in 2009. The uh, old swing bridge was dismantled very, uh, very efficiently, very quickly. Saves TxDOT an enormous amount of money if you think about the operational cost for a swing bridge. More recently, uh, TxDOT built twin segmental bridges on US 281 over Lake Marble Falls. The northbound opened to traffic in 2012, uh, followed by the southbound in 2014. And here's a view of the completed twin structures. I, I think you'll agree with me when you say, you know, segmental bridges can be some of the most graceful architectural bridges that we ever build. And um, this is probably one of my favorites. So we have a future coming as well with regard to segmental bridges, and that is the construction of the US 181 Harbor Bridge, the old Corpus Christi Harbor Bridge that I showed earlier that has some of the earliest pre-stressed beam bridges in Texas is going to be replaced by a new structure um, that will be probably a record-setting segmental bridge in, in the state of Texas for sure uh, with over a main span of over 1,600 feet. It's proposed, currently proposed to be precast uh, segmental. So this brings us to the final concrete bridge type I want to talk about in Texas, and that is the precast concrete network arch. A lot of you are probably familiar with the West 7th Street Bridge. Uh, was completed in October of 2013, and the bridge is believed to be the world's first precast network arch bridge. There are six 163 and a half foot post tension network arches uh, spanning over the Trinity River and a couple lower roadways. Um, architecturally, it it is, in my opinion, probably one of the one of the best bridges that I've ever seen. Um, in order to construct the bridge. They built the arches off-site. They were just a few blocks away. They were then rolled into place using the existing structure as a work platform, so there were only uh, nighttime closures. They did the first arches during the daylight. That's what this photograph covers. Um, and then all the other closures were at night, so the bridge remained, the old existing structure remained in operation uh, for the duration until we've got to that final critical step where it, now it's time to put in the floor beam, so the bridge was completely closed. I believe the order of 124 days was the, in, the entire length of the closure of West 7th Street as we uh, did the demolition and then uh, hung floor beams, which were, of course, precast. And then here comes the old precast deck panels again, one of our really workhorse systems. We were able to make use of that in this instance as well. Again, just using that technology that 90% of our bridges already use, the subdeck panel, uh, really sped construction up. Uh, you can see in this photo there was temporary bracing provided between the arches. That was just during construction. Once the deck had received uh, its initial cure and strength, the, the bracing was, uh, was removed, so there's no portals uh, to obstruct or impede traffic. So this is kind of my last shot, uh, last slide. In a remarkable way, if you think about where we started talking about concrete arch bridges, um, we've kind of gone full circle in that we've come back around and, and sort of made something old, new again, using modern materials and modern methods, but yet we're still relying on uh, some of the principles that were provided to some of our forefathers, if you will, uh, with regard to um, arch, arch bridge behavior. So uh, with that, just some quick acknowledgement. 
Um, particularly want to thank Jamie Ferris for putting this presentation together. Largely, again, it's probably unusual to have a division director do a presentation, but uh, we felt like, again, maybe somebody who'd been here for a third of the history of our department ought to do the presentation. Um, and again, thank you to Charles Walker, uh, who now works for Walter P. Moore, pulled a lot of information from him, uh, as well as Mike Heizak and Andrew Lee, who shot some photos for us in the Beaumont district. So.